Uh, Michigan State, my job is to basically do this, so we work pretty much one-on-one -on -one with farmers around Michigan, mostly vegetable and small fruit, um, looking to do year-round production. I think anyone who is interested in extending their growing season either you know, into the, the fall and early spring or anyone who's interested in growing year-round. I think that it can be at a commercial scale. Um, clearly that's applicable and clearly that's going to help with on-farm viability and hopefully increase farm sales. Um, but we also have seen some home homeowners who are also interested in it, uh, who may have a garden, but they they would like to to get things a little bit earlier or later in the season or even year round. You know, it can be in temperate climates. Um, you know, it can be, you know, traditionally it's kind of looked at as is something that we do up north um, to help mitigate sort of temperature. Um, variations across the season, but there's also growers in the south who use it um, to help decrease disease or you know, help keep rain off of the crops also that, that you know, can help prevent mold growth or other fungal infections. Well, it just depends really on your market what kind of crops you would grow. Um, you can grow things you know, depending on what time of the year, in, in the spring, summer, and fall, we, we're talking about warm season crops, so things like tomatoes, pepper, eggplant, um, yellow, squash, zucchini, um, you can grow carrots, scallions, um, herbs like basil, parsley, um, dill, all those do really well. And then in the winter, we're usually talking about crops that can, can tolerate those cold temperatures, so usually leafy crops, so things like spinach, salad greens, lettuce, um, Swiss chard, kale, and then the root crops like carrots, radishes, um, sometimes fresh market turnips. So for this house, what we did is, you know, we kind of like to think about stuff looking nice on the farm also. And um, so what we did is we took and said, okay, well, let's make this end basically line up with the corner of that barn. So it looks pretty nice, you know, and if there's no other structures, that's okay. We can put it wherever we want to put it. So usually what we like to do is either the day before or the morning of come out, put where we're going to put our corners, kind of look at the site, square it up, walk away, do something else, and then come back either the following day or later that day and square things up. So, um, you know, it's a flat place. Um, the other thing to really think about is, you know, if you're bringing water and electric to it, having it close to um, those sources. Um, and another one is also thinking about access year-round. Range of prices is depending. It's kind of like a car. You know, you can get things stripped down, no power, or anything, or you can, you know, go the other way and get the, you know, the Cadillac version of all power, everything. So, you know, in general, they're ranging somewhere between three and six dollars per square foot. So, you know, if we had say a 30 by 96, I kind of like to do easy math. So we would say that's about 3,000 square feet. And it could range anywhere if we were at that $3 per square foot, you know, it would be around $9,000 for the materials. If we were at that $6, you know, it would be double that, so up to $18,000. And it's important to remember that that's only for the materials. That doesn't involve any of the construction. That doesn't involve um, sort of the hidden costs of, you know, getting water to the site, getting electric to the site. If you're, um, you know, running two layers of plastic, so you need a little inflation fan, or running thermostatically controlled shutters or other venting options like that. Um, some of the other costs I think that, that don't necessarily come to mind right away are the site prep. So, you know, on the one hand we could have no site prep if say we were building it over an already existing field that had good fertility, good organic matter, good soil structure, all of those things. Um, on the other hand, we could be breaking new ground, so we're going to want to, you know, especially if it's in turf or, or, you know, in farm cases, crabgrass or quackgrass, you know, getting in and, and tilling that up, breaking that up, and trying to exhaust those, um, those plants so that you aren't dealing with all these weed problems when you go to, to build um, or when you go to grow. 
Uh, the other, I think, ongoing costs are, you know, the fertility part of it. Um, uh, if you're bringing compost in or, or adding organic matter in some other way, that, that that's an ongoing cost. Um, two of them have been able to pay it back in less than a year. Um, a couple of them are talking about paying it back in <laughs> two to three years. What's that? Yeah, so Laura was saying that if this house was, you know, the structure itself was seven to eight, that keeping in mind there's additional costs above and beyond that, and that she's talking about 13,000. Um, we built a couple of the ones in that research project were about 11,000 for the structure, and then with the water and electric and those things, we add on, you know, somewhere in the you know, 17 to 18,000 or so. So, but again, we're talking about paying that back in, you know, as little as one year. Um, there's one that should be doing a lot better than they are, but that's the nature on farm research. And you know, but mostly we're averaging somewhere between three to four years. So for me, that seems like a pretty good payback on the structure on any sort of investment. If you can put money into it, and you can get your money back and start realizing a profit in a year, between a year and, and four years, that seems like a pretty good payback. It kind of ranges with one, just construction experience in general, and two, with hoop house construction experience. So we have built a number of them, and when we first got started, you know, we were more up in the three to 400 person hour time range. Um, we now have gotten down to more like the 100 or, or 110 person hour time range. So you know, we've done them in as quickly as three days. Um, what we found is that having just one person there who has at least some experience um, building a hoop house really can drastically decrease the time. The more stuff you start standing up, then the more it starts to get out of whack. And if it's pre-drilled, the harder it is to get the bolts to line up or the screws to line up. And it just, you end up fighting yourself the whole time. So it's been our experience that um, when you start to get this many posts, and you'll see as we start to put it together, that with those bows, and then there's one, two, three, four, five purlins, which run end to end. And then we put some baseboards and some hip boards on there, that when that structure starts to get all held together, that we haven't seen any heaving on the 25 or so structures that we have around Michigan, even in the Upper Peninsula where that frost line gets much lower than it does downstate. I don't know off the top of my head what it is for a 34 by 96 foot house, but for a 30 by 96 foot house, for every inch of rain, we displace about 1,800 gallons of water. That's quite a lot of water. Um, and so are there, is there any way to capture that rain or catch that rain? So, Usually with, it's really, really easy to connect or to collect rain if it's a gutter connect, where if you've got a you know, multi bays and you have a gutter down the middle. Um, but it's really hard to vent that passively because when you get over 34 or 35 feet, it gets, you start to get hot pockets from passive cooling. Um, but there is one site at, in Ypsilanti, which is where Eastern Michigan is, uh, or Eastern Michigan University, a site that we're working with there, that they put a big cistern in the ground and they're in the process of putting that in. So I would say that there's some way to do it, but that um, I'm not sure how that's gonna look.